Hello, I'm Abigail, Dr. Abigail Gardner, and um, this is uh, the latest in a series of living room lectures um, provided by the University of Gloucestershire um, to uh, entertain you whilst you lunch. Um, we'll just wait for some people to join the stream and then get going. In the meantime, if you have any comments, you can post them in the post bar on your screen and um, I will be answering the questions towards the end of the session. So again, thanks for coming along. We've got 16 people already. Um, just to say uh, as well, this is not the living room. This is the room that I've been living in since March, it's very small, on the pia piano on one side, books on the other, and um, staring out the window via the laptop. There we go. Just waiting for some more people to come in. Say hello on the comments thread if you want to declare yourself. That would be nice. 16 people. I'll wait for a few more. Someone said, hi, Ab. Oh, there's my brother-in-law. That's disconcerting. I thought this was work saying, isn't it dreadful when two worlds collide? Hi, Ben. I'll wait for 20 people and I'll kick off. <laughs> okay, a few more minutes. One more, so let's kick off. Oh, we lost one. Okay, I think I'm going to start now, for those of you that are here. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the University of Gloucestershire, particularly Leslie Southgate-Thompson and uh, Katie um, for um, doing all the tech on this. And um, I'm going to be talking today about a project called Mapping the Music of Migration. And um, before I do that, um, because I'm going to run through the project, what it means for us, uh, what we're doing, what we found, what I'm going to ask you to think about is that um, throughout your life, you may leave people and places behind, but you might find that music never leaves you. And that's one of the things that we're thinking about on this project. Music is an intangible inheritance, part of your heritage that can never, never be taken away. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you about this project called Mamumi, Mapping the Music of Migration. And the talk should last about 20 minutes or all in and then some questions, um, covers five areas. So the first one is what our project is. Uh, we're an Erasmus Plus funded project running for two years. Um, we have a partnership of um, seven uh, partners all over Europe running it, of which the University of Gloucestershire is one. And um, I'm going to tell you about why the project came about, what its underpinning research is, what, some of the problems that we've encountered. Now we've obviously encountered a pandemic and that's, that's hit us. We've had to adapt and I'm going to tell you how we did that. Some of the data that we found that includes me um, banging out a very bad 80s song one-handed to avoid copyright problems on this piano and the potential ways to theorize our data. So first of all, our project is called Mapping the Music of Migration. 
It's um, a two-year project. It was funded by Erasmus Plus uh, for 271,500 euros. So what that money does is that gives us the, the finances to cover materials and staff time and travel for the, for the duration of the two-year project. We started November 2019 and we carry on until uh, October uh, 21. So it's a two-year um, Erasmus musical inheritance project focused on talking about music and song as a tool for intercultural competency. We have seven partners in Bulgaria, Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Norway and Spain. And in short, what we're doing is collecting, editing and uploading song stories. So that's stories about music. And we're going to upload those to an interactive app. Now, these stories we hoped we'll focus on in, in it, tracks that, that, that people have inherited as they've moved around the world. Um, and we've got some examples of those coming later. Um, we are going to be putting them on an app. Now, I don't have the app yet, but I do have my 18 year olds. I had to dust this this morning. It was disgusting. 18 year olds globe. So the idea, the, the, the idea of the, the whole project is that at the end of the day, at the end of it, we have an app that is a bit like this globe. Can you see there? Okay, where's the globe? There we go. There's where we can't go at the moment, all of them. And we would have uh, a point on the globe where you'd hit and you'd hit Morocco and you'd hear the tale of someone who was passing their driving test and they listened to an 80s track uh, from a film called Footloose before they did that. And then you would hear their journey, they live here now, and you would follow their journey as, as the song um, is interwoven with their words. So that's the whole idea of the app and it will be interactive, it will be able to be added to. So the idea is that it becomes this kind of um, interactive and sustainable archive of um, songs and movement. Okay. Um, the project team, now it's very important to say that even though I, it's me here, I'm the full guy having to do the, the talks for this, but um, I'm one of a team. And it's a very large team. Uh, the project team is, I'm going from um, alphabetical order here, Caminos in, in uh, Andalusia in Spain, and that's Daniel and Angela. Um, Centre for Social Innovation in uh, Nicosia, Cyprus, and uh, that's Anita. Um, Kemop, which is in Athens, Greece, that's Aphrodite. Creativo Svilupo, uh, oh, Centro Svilupo Creativo, I always get that wrong, um, from Palermo, and that's Dario. Um, no one can in Sofia, Bulgaria, and that's uh, Laura and Maya, and the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences. And I'm grateful to Kai, Anna Hansen, and Camilla Kual for their contribution there. So, as you can see, everyone has chosen these are NGOs uh, and universities. So, universities of, 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 in Norway and, and Gloucestershire are kind of um, packaging the whole project in, a, in an academic way, and the other uh, partners are all involved in. Um, work to do with migration, uh, specifically in Palermo and Athens and, um, and Cyprus, and with arts and music and cultural activities and, um, and development work. So we are really a kind of research team working on that area. Um, when you do a project for Erasmus, you have to say what you're going to deliver. And there have to be what we call deliverables, outputs, things that, could, that people outside of this room, this box, this university can use, make use of. So the first one of those that we had to do was a methodological framework. We had to work out what uh, initiatives or policy there were in all of our countries <clears throat> dealing with music and migration. We thought there might be not very many, which is why we put the bid in. And we were right, there aren't very many. Um, there are policies around arts and theatre and play music. These are mostly NGOs and uh, third sector, it's not really governmental or uh, policy uh, work. So we thought that there's a real gap here for um, NGOs to have spaces to talk about music that can help with diversity and intercultural competence and communication. Because we've done previous work with Erasmus. I've been involved on a project that was um, a media literacy app for uh, low skilled migrant workers. We've done another uh, digital storytelling project, and I'll explain what digital storytelling is in a minute. And what we'd found was that um, there's an awful lot of uh, what, uh, buzzwords around integration and um, uh, citizen and migrant, and these are quite fixed points. Um, and integration seemed to us to be something that 
would go just one way is to integrate into somewhere. And we've found with the focus groups and surveys we've done already that when people talk about music, it's much more of a, um, a two way process, not just going one way. So in the work that I've done already on this project, I found out an awful lot about music from Tunisia, from uh, Bangladesh, uh, from Jordan. And that kind of integration strategy where uh, what comes with someone is not lost, but is part of that is, is, is where we're heading. And so we're making um, a user guide on how to uh, develop our song workshops, our Mamumi music workshops, where NGOs, people working with uh, migration and any other uh, vulnerable uh, sectors of the community we think this could work with, uh, where um, people talk about a piece of music that might have made them happy. Now, some of this work comes from another project I've been working on with Rod Jennings, Sarah Cohen and Lynn Grenier called Troubling Inheritances, where we've talked about pieces of music you want to pass on or that you've inherited. And that comes from a BBC4 programme, um, Inheritance Tracks. Um, but what we found with our work so far in this is that people aren't willing to pass things on. They're want to, wanting to think about where they've been and what reminds them of where they were. Um, so we're going to make also an audio archive of the conversations in those workshops that go on, because the conversations are the interesting points of, of, of departure on what, what kind of conversations can be had. And then finally, we're going to make our song stories app, this one where you will go around the globe and listen to stories from all over and tracks. Um, and then myself and Kayana Hansen will be writing a research paper about that. So that is the actual uh, thing the thing that we've got the 270,000 and a half euros for. So why we did this was that um, my work is really interested in um, music and media. So that's the way that music is represented, uh, how music is mediated, how in particular women in music are mediated. And I've worked in the area of music and, and memory. One of the uh, scholars I'm really um, uh, impressed by on this is, is Jose van Dijk and Karen Blichtervelt from the uh, Netherlands and they talk about the idea that when uh, we share music we share stories. Uh, mus we, we share the stories about when we encounter that music, what it means for us, where it takes us back to. So music acts as a kind of trigger, a kind of memory prop for us. Um, and previous work that I'd done was on digital storytelling and I wanted to combine the two. Digital storytelling is um, a very, uh, um, let me find the app there, there we go. It's a way of um, telling a story which involves uh, the voice and images. You don't see the person, it's not like an interview. And we've worked with Age UK, we've worked with um, secondary school kids across Europe, uh, I've worked with vulnerable adults and um, teenagers in foster care. And digital storytelling is when you sit down with somebody and you start to look through the photos that are important to them and you start to work with them to develop a script. And um, a memory prompt would be something like a photo. So there you can see, that's the photo there, that's my grandmother, my nana and my mum outside her caravan and I'll bring my nana back into the picture in a bit. But that picture would act as a trigger for people to tell a story. Um, and I was going to show you a digital story, we can't double screen because of the reflections, but I'm going to tell you about a digital story from a, a woman called Sally who we worked with uh, as part of an Age UK Veterans Voices project in Gloucestershire. Now Sally used to be in the uh, RAF and uh, she was in Aden, which is now Yemen. And when she was in Aden, she was an admin officer. And suddenly someone discovered that she, um, she could sing, she could dance, she was a jazz singer. She also was very good at um, telling people what to do. So she started the theatre and stage events in this camp in Aden. And there are lots of brilliant photos of Sally in stripy tops with beehives, with her dancers and singers, with jazz trios, with all the troops with their, their tops off, no sun cream, listening to this jazz band in Aden in the early 60s. It's a brilliant story. You don't see her, you just hear a voice, which is very important. And at the end of the story, she says that one thing really happened to her there that started 
her to reconsider everything. And that was one of the th three people, three of her friends got blown up in a truck. And um, she went to their funeral in the desert and the last post was playing. And her story was brilliant for its simplicity and its narrative arc, but it was also interesting for me because I thought, hey, we, we could play the last post and that would generate something more to talk about. That music, rather than the photo, could act as a memory prop. So that's where I started to think about mapping the music of migration. Okay, now here's my nana again. Okay, she lived in a rented bungalow in the outskirts of Bournemouth and she had migrated, I guess, from the northeast from a colliery village where her family had been coal miners for years. She came down to the south to be a cleaner. Her sister was a charwoman, her dad was a coal hewer. And we went down every Sunday because my dad, there's my dad, had to mow the lawn. And my dad hated mowing the lawn. He hated my grandmother, he hated her dog. On the way back from Bournemouth, and we lived in South Somerset. Every Sunday, this would be on the radio. Without the bum note at the back. Well, that's done for copyright. I could do two hands, but I haven't got the music. I'm not very good. But that played every single time in the car. It was a BBC Two radio show um, called Cliff Something Singers. And it was Sing Something Simple. So Sing Something Simple for me. Our cares go by, just you and me. And every time I hear that, I think of Sundays with my grandmother, how she used to make apple pie really well, and how my dad hated her dog and the lawn mowing. So I thought, you know, I could use that little hook there, that trigger, those few notes, and that could be a digital story. That could be something that we could talk about. And what's more interesting as well is that um, my dad, here we go, here we go, he's gone there, there he is. He was a real jazz head. He, 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 he was born in um, Hastings, he grew up in Bournemouth. He was a real, real jazz head. He, had, he loved Errol Garner, he loved Stan Getz, he loved Ella Fitzgerald, sort of Vaughan. And um, my youngest child, his globe this is, um, didn't meet him before he died and my youngest son is also really into jazz so these kind of synapses and triggers start happening when you think about music. So the whole point then was that we would use music as a way into talking about the past, the present, people's futures and we had the idea um, on the back of our uh, reviews of our literature about what was available for talking about music not just making it or consuming it or being a fan or an audience but talking about its importance in your life where was that where was there a space for that in ngo work in migration work in work with refugees and asylum seekers now there isn't any so we were going to run some focus groups throughout february and march across our seven countries um and i managed to run one in Cheltenham before March the 16th. So on March the 14th, I talked to a couple of um, young women, one of whom was from um, Algeria. And what was really interesting about her story was that um, we talked very shortly uh, about the project, about music. And she was talking about this the Italian um, golden coin program that she'd um, listened to when she was in Italy. She went to Italy from, from Algeria. Um, and how that was part of her peer group when she grew up. But now, as she's in the UK and um, she's got older, she's listening more to Algerian music, to Algerian shabby music. So I had no idea what Algerian shabby music, so we talked about that. I had never met this young woman before, but talking about the music was some kind of third space, some kind of neutral, almost neutral ground where we could both be interested and I could learn something from her. Um, in um, in Palermo, our Palermo colleague Stario managed to do some Skype calls and learn all about um, Tunisian wedding music. But what we had to do, rather than conversations, we had to start a survey. And what might be interesting for me to share with you is some of the returns from our initial survey. And that might give you an idea of what's happening on the ground. So um, in Bulgaria, 
many of the migrants that um, our Bulgarian colleagues talked with are from Europe. They're from England, Italy, Kosovo, uh, Belgium, uh, some from New Zealand and one and some from Kazakhstan. Um, in Cyprus, a lot from uh, West Africa, from Spain, uh, from North, North Macedonia. In Palermo, mainly West Africa, Senegal, uh, Gabon, uh, Cameroon, Gambia, and North Africa, Tunisia. In Norway, uh, the migrants people talked to were uh, European. In Spain, they were mainly from Latin America, which I hadn't realized. I learned something there. Uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, and British migrants as well. The Spanish um, mentioned that there were British migrants. And in the UK, uh, we had responses from uh, people from Bengal, uh, uh, Bengalis, Moroccans, Indians, Israelis, Portuguese, Spanish, and Algerian. Um, so that gives you a kind of sense of the diversity of places that people are going to be coming from that will be mapped onto our interactive app and the, the the questions we had were really you know do you do you listen to music on your phone uh when do you listen to music is there an event in particular that uh you remember uh what's the power of music for you so we use these as kind of dummy run focus group questions and we've we've um looked at them and finalized them for use in our workshops now um i'm going to share some of the uh um responses with you because they're really interesting because sometimes some of our uh, preconceptions were that people would bring music from where they were now that's too simple i think and as a music academic i realized that the music that i grew up doesn't come from south somerset it came from new york it came from berlin it came from wherever okay so i'm going to take you back to um the respondent who came from morocco and um, some more really crap. Oh, sorry, some more really bad piano playing here. So let's see if you can. I, let, let's see if you can um, see who, who this is. Oh, let's one of them. So, marvellous recital there by the copyright cleared one finger piano playing. Bonnie Tyler holding out for a hero from Footloose 1980s. And this guy told me that he listened to that. That's the most important piece of music in his life because he listened to it before he took his driving test in Morocco and he passed. Um, and this guy is now a community uh, police officer in, in the UK, kind of huge chap. And I just thought it was just so brilliant that Bonnie Tyler was helping him with his driving test there. I've got some other uh, ideas here. Um, I can't play the, the, the track, but it's another 80s kind of pop song called uh, Lune de Miel, it's French. This reminds me of the first time I saw my mother drunk and dancing. That was lovely. Um, Rod Stewart, handbags and glad bags. This was from a respondent in Bulgaria. And it said, reminds me of the hard times I've gone through. Etta James, at last, makes me want to dance. Uh, Abdul Wahib Hanachi, Mabubi, it's a Tunisian song. I was listening to this in quarantine. Yusun Dor, Immigre, Senegal. This is a song by West African um, uh, Yusun Dor. Reminds me of when I was in Jordan, a song by Nancy Arjam. So already we've got uh, a mix of pop, folk, uh, we've got music from everywhere. And I think that's one of the things that I'm finding really very useful and very interesting in that um, expectations of what people bring with them uh, should not be in place we should be open to understanding that music flows everywhere people flow everywhere there's going to be some really interesting cross connections there so 
I'm going to go on to some of the thoughts and challenges that we've got now because um, we are supposed to be going to Norway in October, looking a bit unlikely at the moment, but uh, to look at how we're going to run our Mamma Mia music workshops, which is where you'd all sit down together, you'd all um, share a piece of music, it would be played, you discuss how it made you feel, what happened at that time. And what's what's interesting about the results so far is that the emotional um, responses that people have can be shared. The familiar responses that people have can be shared. I mean, not everyone's seen their mum drunk and dancing for the first time, but I kind of like, I, I'd like to meet that woman. Um, and there is some sense of empathy that is engendered when we listen to other people's stories. And I think that what's really important about this project as well as talking about mapping and intercultural communication and diversity awareness it's about listening and it's about listening without prejudice it's about listening without any preconception and it's about listening to find these points of connection i think um so i'm gonna sort of round this off with some ideas around uh, some of the emerging thoughts that we have. It's the kind of the everydayness of a project like this. Um, a lot of the time I went, uh, I've been trying to get people from um, different communities in Cheltenham here to be involved in the project. And when people hear some other stories and hear some other kind of responses that they're, they're interested, but at first it's it's kind of seems trivial. So many other important things happen. We've got a pandemic, we've got austerity, uh, everything everything why would people be interested in talking about music it seems so trivial but the everyday and i'm a great believer in this the everyday is really re important to hone in on for those points of connection and for those interesting kind of areas of, of um an analysis so i think everydayness and commonality is something we're interested in looking at here and i want to de-exceptionalize displacement and what I mean by that is that when we talk about migrant, you know, arguably my grandmother was a migrant. She left the coal fields of Durham to search for work. Her dad was on the Jarrow March. They had nothing. She moved for work. She didn't move abroad. She, she, she just moved. And I come from a family who, who, whose movement is all over the place, never fixed. So talk, talk, being called a migrant seems to me um, problematic in that it just fixes someone in at one point on a very long journey. Um, and we're trying to kind of intersperse that with stories about uh, music that was before that journey and or music that might be going forward on that journey. Um, Tom Weston is a, an academic that I'm following a lot. He's a geographer, cultural geographer, and he's been working in Athens on soundscapes. And he talks about migration as a sonic process. And I think it would be really interesting if you listen to that, if you, if you listen to cars with their windows down, and listen to the music that people are playing, um, and listen to street sounds. Um, and people have sonic agency. That is that, that the music is theirs. It's, it's, it's ingested by them. It's, it, it's something that means to them. Bonnie Tyler's holding up for a hero means something to our, to our Moroccan um, um, participant. There's something also about belonging and non-belonging that we want to start start questioning about um, migration. And what I found with talking to uh, the um, uh, older people on um, Veterans Voices storytelling was that when people tell a story, and if they have to tell it a number of times, it becomes a performance in itself. So what we're not looking for is reality, per se, or truth because that's a very nebulous concept when we're looking at these kind of stories. I mean, I think I remember my nana baked apple pie, but you know, that doesn't matter. What matters is that little few notes, piece of music that takes me back there and maybe offers a conversation with someone else whose nana had a dog or who'd moved from somewhere. Finally, one of the, um, challenges that we have is that when we're funded by uh, an EU body, uh, there are expectations about our language and uh, what we talk about in terms of host country and citizenship and integration. Um, and those are very fixed in institutional talk. Academics will start to take those apart. 
what does host country mean what does citizenship mean what does integration mean and so all of those things are what we're going to be um talking about um obviously we have a, a website it's uh www.mamumi.com mapping the music of migration eu and that's where our um uh, video is for how to run a music workshop and that's where all our audio archives will be stored and our interactive app will be found we obviously have a facebook site we have an instagram we have twitter we are everywhere and um i think i want to um i think i've thanked everyone so far that's on the team apart from the university funding office team which is gideon uh kp and annabelle holder um and i want to go back to what i started with by saying you may leave people and places behind, but music never leaves you. And um, I'd like to finish on that and um, take any questions. Now, I know it's um, nerve wracking to put a question up here, but let's have a look and see if people have got any. Um, I've just got highs at the moment. Oh, I've got a question from uh, my compatriot, Ben Wardle. Hello there, Ben. Why is it important not to see the subject of digital storytelling? Um, because Digital storytelling has been used. It started in 1984 in California by Joe Lambert at the Story Center. And um, it's used for patient healthcare. It's used for uh, vulnerable groups. It's used for trauma. It's used for all sorts of things like that. Um, and so it, for those kind of reasons, it hasn't historically had the person in, in, in it. Um, and also what you find is that if you're interviewing someone or if someone's on camera, they are performing themselves somehow. Uh, it's, it's hugely disconcerting for me to be on here in my house whilst my teenage is not getting up. Um, so what's important is the voice. That's what we want. It's a listening. It's more of a podcast type thing with just visuals. And it's important that they're not uh, moving visuals as well. It's very lo-fi. Anyone can do it. And I've had great success with um, a project called GEM, Going the Extra Mile, where we um, did a digital story of someone who had been in and out of um, various um, institutions uh, f f for various uh, problems and um, needed to build up some self-esteem. So he didn't want to be on camera, but he had painted some stained glass uh, work. He'd done some stonewalling. He'd done all this stuff. So we had photos of that and he could talk to that. So it's about self-esteem. So it's a processual um, um, medium rather than a product. It's not broadcastable, really. Um, are we thinking about workshops with children as well as adults? We have done workshops with children, secondary school. Uh, the GDPR on that is... Uh, uh, a, a, um, a matrix of, of challenges to be overcome but we have done that and if you're interested in looking at those there's a website called misty www.mysty.eu um, and we worked on ideas around family food and festivals so any more questions so Ben, again, digital storytelling started with the idea of a, you'd have a memory prop and you'd work with uh, photos. I like the idea of uh, working with um, one piece of uh, media or an image that can spark a story. So that's why, Ben, the musical element is for me the same kind of thing as a digital story. So we don't see the person, we just hear their voice. We don't even see an image as this. We see them on their journey through the app. And we will interweave that copyright forgiving with the song. So that's how it kind of works. Ava Krenitzi asks, will you be organising some of these workshops in Cheltenham? Yes, we will. They will run in Cheltenham. There's a video running that already. Has the technology used digital storytelling changed a lot and will it continue to evolve? It's, it's, the technology for digital storytelling is simple. It's super simple. You don't even need to have a, an iPhone. Any old phone will do. All you need is some pictures and um, something to record your voice on. And um, what I can do uh, is somehow post all the links up there for you to have a, a listen to those. Um, any other questions? Adam Molliver, is there a difference for P? 
Would you, Adam, would you like to? Oh. Brilliant question, Adam. Thanks for that. Adam asks, is there a difference in cultures with strong culture of traditional music and more pop oriented cultures? So that's something that we're starting to have a look at. Um, and I think what's going to happen is okay, when you've got people moving around, you've got a mishmash of, mu of, 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 of music traveling with them. So we found that, Al you know, uh, Algeria had shabby music, which I found out about. Um, but it might be, you know, this was because it was going back a generation to this young woman's parents. Um, so generational uh, hierarchies are going to have to be uh, investigated as well when we start to map the data. Um, I haven't, uh, I haven't heard from our Spanish partners yet what the, what the people who've moved from say Brazil or Argentina or uh, Chile have, 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 have been growing up with. Um, and I don't know what the uh, nationality of the person in Bulgaria who'd listened to Rod Stewart had. But what I do like is that it, uh, what that's really good. I'll keep that, Adam, if you don't mind, as a, as a query for us later on, and she'll be fully acknowledged. Um, I think there will be a difference. But what's interesting to me is about the, the different flows, the flow of people, flow of music, and then uh, the flow of people between, uh, across migration into citizenship and, and back and beyond. Um, yes, Chris. Hello, Chris. Yes, we definitely could work. I have tried working with um, a Syrian community and um, obviously there's, there's going to be translation issues as well. Um, and as I say, we're, we're the university are working with it, but uh, across our partnership, it's our NGO partners have very, very close networks with um, refugee um groups and migrant and asylum seeking groups so they're they're working with them are there any other questions at all okay if there's no other questions i'd like you to um well, well i'd like not like not you to do anything but it would be great if you could um, have a look at our website and um, if you want to get involved with the workshops we will be looking to run them in the autumn it may be online it may not be maybe socially distanced um, we would need about uh, six people in a workshop that's all we need and uh, it would be myself um, and Julia Habel who I've forgotten up to this moment Julia Habel uh, is the excellent audio uh, uh, professional on this project, uh, dealing with all the um, technology for audio. She's a colleague of mine and works for BBC as an independent documentary producer on radio. And last but not least, Brian Panks, who has made our animated video to accompany the workshop on how to do a workshop. So do um, email me at agardener.com gloss.ac.uk or tweet me on at abgardener1 and I'd be really happy to get more people involved in this. Ben again, all the questions from Mr Wardle. Is there a gender equal balance in terms of the respondents? That's a thorny question because as a consortium we decided not to concentrate on gender at this point because of the many different considerations we would have to give to that were we to do it. The idea was that largely in our focus groups to generate our workshops, people were anonymous because it was surveys. We just wanted age. I was more interested in age because of issues around inheritance and the kind of entry point that people might come into listening to something. Um, and because in some of the partnerships that we work with, there are specific requirements if you're going to work around gender and specific institutional issues that you have to do. So we haven't, we're not dealing with that now. Okay. Could we take one more question, please? Well, obviously there's got to be applause for my hideous piano playing. I can only play piano with music. Uh, that's the Star Wars theme up there at the moment. Um, not Beethoven, I'm afraid. Um, so I had to use uh, use my one finger special. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there.
because uh, I think we've had all the questions. Um, thank you so much for turning up. Uh, I'd like to thank my teenager for not bursting in and asking what's for lunch. Good on him. And um, any more, uh, any more uh, follow ups again, do find us on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and website. Mamumi, Mapping the Music of Migration. Bye.